Hey, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're really excited that you are here today with us. Um, we have a conversation that I think we always, it's always in the back of our mind. And we always think, how do we know, you know, how do we navigate this? Larry G. Raff is here to talk to us about understanding major donors. Larry, are you going to like kind of blow our minds today and give us some ideas that we didn't know? Well, I think I'm going to introduce you to some different thinking, perhaps, that you haven't thought about before, to be sure. <laughs> well, I love that. That's always a good day for me when I get to learn something new. And this is a, a topic that, um, oh my gosh, for so many of us is really a critical piece. Um, another thing that we want to let everybody know is, is uh, we are really excited about a new cohort of co-hosts. Say that fast three times. Um, they come to us from all over the country. And so over uh, this month and next month, you're going to see us rolling out, introducing these new um, co-hosts. We're really excited about it. And you might have already seen some of them joining us on the nonprofit show. The other group that joins us each and every day are our sponsors, and they are amazing. Most of them have been with us since day one, more than a thousand shows back. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Um, these are the rock stars that help you become a rock star because they support our industry. Okay, Larry G. Raff, you were just in New York yesterday talking to a group. You're back in your hometown of Boston. Talk to us about what Abacus does. Be happy to, Julia. Thank you. Abacus is a brand new tool, the only of its kind, that operationalizes donor research to provide you with an objective, bias-free number to ask a donor for, for a three-year pledge. So if you're in a campaign, wow. if you're doing a special initiative where you're asking for major gifts, we all know you can collect all this information and you never have it all. And then you have to figure out, okay, what are we going to ask this couple for? How much? Right. Well, Abacus is a 21 questions only, easy online uh, way to get to those numbers. And because uh, we have enough uh, su subscribers and data now, we are seeing that our predictive accuracy is within 5% of actual pledges. So you can use it to value your pipeline as well as figure out how much to ask someone for a gift. We're very excited about it. You should be. You know, um, you and I need to offline. Um, I need to get with one of your folks or maybe you and get I, I would love to get a, a tour of this to, to see how your product works. Um, and 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 while we're not really here to have you sell your product, but I got to ask this question. How do you structure your your clients? Are you like a monthly fee or is it per track? Or how, how is it that you navigate with Good your clients? Good question. It's for individuals, it's a subscription. It's a monthly uh, amount. It's either uh, $45 a month or it's 65 because we have the, the ability to ask questions about your sector. So if you're in performing okay. arts or if you're in healthcare oh, wow. or if you're, you know, if, if you're in behavioral health, there'll be other questions. And, uh, and then if you're a large shop or a small shop, uh, we talk about a, uh, an annual fee. So it's all very affordable, so particularly compared to the wealth assessment um, services that are out there. Uh, so, I, I, you know, my, my desire, I've been in the business over 40 years. My desire is just to get this tool out there to help help nonprofits and uh, all good will come from that. Yeah, I love it. Wow, that's cool. Not what I expected you to say. I thought it would be you know, really an arduous um, financial commitment. So super cool. Well, like I said, um, offline, let's, I, I would love to get a tour of, the, of your product to learn more about it because this is, as we're going to talk 
um, really one of these things. And, and we were talking in the green room chatter, you know, there's a gut feeling and I feel good about this and good fortune's going to come and you're going to say, yeah, not so fast. It's kind of a myth. What are we looking at here, Larry? Well, it, 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 it is a myth. And we're going to talk a little bit about bias, uh, money bias as well. But through our beta testing and through our experience over the many years, the reality is when you're ready to have a gift conversation with a donor, you're still using your gut and hoping for the best because if the, if the donor asks you, hey, Larry, where did you come up with that number? Yeah. Which, I've, which has happened. You need a reasonable answer, <laughs> you know, oh. a, prof a professional answer. Yeah. And trusting your gut is not that. So it's really no way to run a, an industry or a profession to when you're at the end game of the whole development process of getting to a major gift ask, you're at the end game. You have nothing to help you objectively come up with what you need to have that conversation. Okay, Larry, tell me what the answer is to that question, because um, I'm, I've never been a professional fundraiser. I've been a community advocate and, and championed you know, many nonprofits. And I've sat in those meetings. I've made the ask a lot of times, many times. I still do. No one has ever asked me that. And if I had been asked that question, I would have freaked out. I got a man up. I would have been like, what? I mean, I probably would have said, well, they told me to ask you. I mean, <laughs> that's right. right. Because that's really what's happened. I can think of over, you know, 40 years of doing this in my community. Um, the development director, the CEO would say, okay, we're going to meet with Mr. and Mrs. Smith and we're going to try and get them to give us X amount and you're the girl. Okay. Right. And so right. if somebody had asked me that, tell me how to handle that. Well, and even if they asked the CEO or the development director that question, they they would have to finesse it, I'm sure, and yeah. say, well, we want to be respectful, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And we don't know what's what's in your what's in your pocketbook, but would you please consider a gift of X? And what I always what I always follow up with is, and if we haven't asked you for enough, please tell me. Wow. Twenty percent of the people come to the meeting with a larger number than was asked for. Okay, I'm adding that in my bag of tricks. Add I it. have never Add done it. that. And you know what else happens? People smile or they laugh when you say it. And that's the kind of frame of mind you want them in when they're considering your ask. Oh. It, it's a win both ways. Yeah. And you know what, Larry? I think it's genuine. It is genuine. No question. It is genuine. It's genuine. Do you think that this myth becomes less of a myth the more you are in this this industry, this sector, this part of the nonprofit world, that um, you know your donors, you know your community, um, or do you still think that this really is just something that we, is part of how we ask, that we're not really being prepared enough? How do you see that arc? The, the, it's a very good question. Well, the arc is, I agree, we're, we're never prepared enough because mm -hmm. if we're relying on our bias and yeah. interpretation of this data that goes through our bias filter, yeah. then then there's 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 the, the likelihood you're gonna leave money on the table, yeah. right? And trust me on this, you never know what people have. You never ever know what people have. And the best research, you can hire the research, you know, come back with, ask for this, or they can afford that. And it's far too often the case that, that they could afford much, 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 much more because you can't capture all that information. Interesting. So you really feel, you feel confident that it's generally more and not less. Because I think human nature would be, and maybe this is like fierce talking because I think a lot of times we we go into these asks being fearful and in that scarcity mentality. You really do feel like it's there is more abundance than we ever consider. Well, 
especially these days. And the reason you're fearful is because you have nothing behind you that backs up the number and the rationale. That's why you're fearful. If you did have a basis for a non-biased basis, you go in with strength. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, yes, people, if they've accepted an invitation to have a conversation about a gift to your organization, then they have capacity. Yeah, I love it. Well, let's talk about this this other thing, and that's fundraising headwinds. Yeah. What does that mean to you, and what should that mean to us? Well, uh, I, there are several, and they're dynamic. Uh, so a shrinking donor pool, uh, AFP just came out with data, you know, 50,000 plus donors uh, are 7% fewer this year than last year. Uh, which accounts for almost 90% of total giving. So that's fundamentally a problem. And small dollar donors are shrinking as well. Um, uh, making sense of donor research, which I've talked about. There's there's just, it's, it's just wild, wild uh, swings. And I, and I did research on this and, I'll, and I'll talk, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, the philanthropic capacity estimates, you know, the I waves and the donor searches of the world, you know, the the results they come up with can vary significantly from reality. They're very good at taking thousands of names in your file and and scoring them and getting it down to something, but that's about it because uh, because of the high variability. Uh, personal and organizational biases about money, ever present. You know, some organizations, human service organizations might say, oh, how could I ask for a million dollars for my my organization? Well, if the numbers add up to making sense that you should, then get over your bias about your organization. You're worth it. Make the ask, right? Um, uh, know a process internally about arriving at an ask amount. Uh, often there's the buck doesn't really stop anywhere. Analysis paralysis. Right. Yeah. You yeah. never, you never, ever know what you uh, w want to know and need to know, but don't let that stop you from having the gift conversation. And there's a lot of new gift officers in the field. You know, there's been a, a recent, a, a real strong influx of folks and we need to get them to be much more productive, much more quickly because the, the competition is much stiffer. There's more nonprofits and fewer major donors. That, yeah adds up to a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we go on the nonprofit show, we go by the number 1.8 million registered nonprofits um, in the country. And, and, you know, I would argue there are a hell of a lot more that are kind of under the radar that aren't necessarily, um, you know, tracking and, and doing what they should legally. Um, but I think one of the things is that it's so varied and we don't have those pillars of giving you know, we have ancillary and somewhat, if dare I say, kind of, you know, off the of, off the of main highway kind of people, right? We have um, very unusual nonprofits mm -hmm. that people can give to, as opposed to the main pillars that that we used to give throughout our communities, whether they be faith based or they be, you know, human mm -hmm. services or mm -hmm. health. I mean, but we have things that are, you know, like chinchilla rescues and not to negate them but do you know what i mean we have very boutique boutique yeah uh, that's the right word thank you that's the right word and that might um reach somebody's heart and their value system and it, it's it's really an issue i mean i talk to so many ceos that are just shocked at the amounts of money that go to that go away from their organizations when they believe they're, you know, frontline organizations mm -hmm. really doing the hard work. And then they see money bleeding off into other uh, sectors that, that um, maybe they don't feel are as, is important to the whole community. But in my estimation, Larry, these companies that are, are taking more of a, a lion's share, they're well marketed, they're well branded, they're communicating with donors they're more strategic, right? And, and so they have more money and more budget to do all of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they're making that investment. They are right? making that investment. The donor retention, yeah. it's easier to get a gift from a previous donor than from a new person. Right. And so the investment in retaining your donors 
and growing your donor pool is will pay back. There's yeah. just no question of it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you mentioned, and I can't wait to get into this, is money bias. Yeah. What is money bias? I think well, we're all going to be able to know this. Let me, uh, we, I mean, we were, we, all of us were born into different circumstances, you know, some, some less affluent, some very affluent. And so the amount, a $10,000 gift from me is the same as a 50 or hundred thousand dollar gift from somebody else. Yeah. So I did a, I did research over 10 years and I gave fundraisers over 400 of them, two case studies, 21 questions each, the same that are in the calculator. And I said, okay, tell me how much you want you would ask to the small donor and ask to the large donor. Well, the small donor, the range of responses was $25,000 to $250,000. For the large donor, it was 50,000 50, to 3 million. What? Now, mind you, this is the same set of data. They're all fundraisers. And the bias that is at play and how they interpret the information, yeah. and it could be because they're new or they're seasoned, seasoned people might go to 3 million, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, or the nature of the organizations that they work for, that's money bias in numbers, in, in the actuality uh, of, of real circumstances. And that's why you need an, a non-biased, objective way to get to a, a value that you then vet with people who know the donor and say, they'll say, they get a reality check. You know, they'll say, hey, you're crazy. That's, that's way too much. Or, or they can do a lot more than that. I love that. Ser seriously. That. Seriously. And, and so that's, that's why I created Abacus. It's sim simply put. That's just no way to, to run a business when you're asking your best donors for the most you've ever asked them for, and you have no solid basis for why. Yeah. You know, how off-putting or maybe off-putting isn't the right word, but how, but asking for the wrong amount or, a, you know, too low, too high, how does that impact the discussion does it does it ever torpedo it because the donor can't get beyond it or everybody's so stressed out and the tension you know is is escalating like because it seems to me this is such a pivotal piece of the relationship going forward not just sitting there in that restaurant or that conference room or wherever right on your campus it it seems like we we have this stumbling block that's it's pretty big. Yeah. How, what does that look like to you? Well, I think it's language oriented. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I use sort of a, a set kind of language uh, and, and it's, it's, you want to disarm two things. You want to disarm the research. So say, I don't know what's in your pocketbook. I don't know what you're capable of or what your financial pressures are, but I want to be respectful. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, please forgive me if I screw up. That's what it's saying. Yeah, I and, love that. And you say, would you please consider, would you please join us? Because everyone who's here has given. Right. Right? It's mm -hmm. a social bond. Mm -hmm. Please join us and consider a gift of $100,000 that can be paid over three years. And if we haven't asked you for enough, please tell me. Love it. That's the language that we that we typically use that I train my clients on using. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very useful. I want to tell you a quick story uh, to illustrate what bias is about because it's more than what I just described. Uh, a client, uh, Humane Society, executive director and board chair, go into a couple's home and and the calculator when it was in an Excel format said ask for a hundred thousand dollars over three years, and they go into the home. And it's not very updated. The kitchen hasn't been updated for a long time. And they're starting to get cold feet. Yeah. Their bias is kicking in. Yeah. Right? And they signal to each other to go to plan B. Plan B was 50000 And in the course of the conversation, when they showed the couple the gift chart, 
the couple volunteered a gift of $100,000 before they got to the ask. So if, if they had followed their bias and asked for 50, they may very well have left 50,000 on the table. Yeah, yeah. And that's where bias shows up very commonly. It's so interesting. And I learned that selling shoes, getting through college. <laughs> people, people who have money wear good shoes because mm -hmm. they don't like their feet to hurt. Mm -hmm. And they can look ragtag clothing, but they've got good shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. Oh, my God. That, that's just fabulous. Well, I think that that's a great example of, of where we we do take to look at things and, and, you know, use that word bias. We, we really form an opinion that's, you know, tough because it's mostly emotional. And then we follow our gut. It's just like what you said in the very beginning, that myth of, of what we think is going on. So this leads me to kind of my last question of our time uh, with you. When is it right to make an ask? And we get this information um, and we, we get through all of the emotion and the relationship building. So when is it right to put this all together and proceed with making the ask? Right. Good question. And it's back to that analysis paralysis problem. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, on the calculator, we, we you know, in addition to offering a, a suggested ask amount and what to expect, we have a readiness score. So if you haven't, if you were unable to answer some of the 21 questions, we're feeding back to you and telling you, hey, you're not ready. You need more research and more discovery to get the answers to this question. Like, you know, what was the largest gift they made to another organization as a, for instance, uh, have they made an estate? Have they included you in their estate plan? Those are the sorts of things you get by knowing the people building that relationship. So when you then get to is it, when's the right time to ask? It's it's twofold. One, do you have the right information to make the right judgments about what that gift conversation is going to be about? And secondly, did you ask the donor to meet with you in order to discuss a gift to the campaign or to the organization? And as long as you don't ambush them right. and you're saying this is a meeting to discuss a gift or your support of, mm -hmm. then they're ready. Mm -hmm. Then they're ready to have to make a gift 99% of the time. Sometimes something happens in between, but 99% of the time, if they know that this is about a gift conference, this is about a gift, then they're ready to have that conversation. Now, it may not close that day, mm -hmm. right? You can ask them and ask, say they need to sleep on it, they need to talk to their advisor or what have you. Uh, and if it's a bigger number than they were expecting, you need to say, oh, well, you know, instead of three years, if it, if it would be easier to, over five years to fulfill this request, then that, that would be fine. That would work. So you need to be prepared for the objections and for the what is, the what abouts, uh, so don't expect to close it on that day, but they're ready to be asked. Right. And that's what's important. I, I love that you separated those two because I think you're right. I think, um, you know, the, the actual um, aspect and the, the discipline of, you know, getting the meeting, preparing for that meeting and making the ask needs to be separate from the closing and how we, we look at what a success in a failure is and like how do we feed the pipeline it's it's all of those things and and we talk about cause selling that's something that a lot of times um i don't see enough of uh our folks in development in the nonprofit sector recognizing it's more just like did we get the money or didn't we right yeah, it's it, transactional uh, yeah. yeah it drives me nuts because that's not the way that you build that sustainable approach that's right and, and, and julie something i preach is it's easier to get the pledge than to get the pledge payment. True that. Right? And you need to steward them once they make a pledge. That's when the work starts because yeah. you need to keep them engaged. Yeah. So that they pay that pledge. Right. Right. The, 
wiser words have never been spoken. Absolutely. And again, we don't focus on that. I think a lot of times we forget that that is a big part. It's it's just customer service, which we don't use that word enough. Uh, we true. use the word stewardship, but it is customer service. And uh, there is there is a there is a solution to that too. But it would be it's typically frowned upon in the business. Uh, and I converted a major hospital to this. To so if you get a ten thousand dollar pledge from someone, you book it that year as a $10,000 income, mm -hmm. right? Well, what if you just booked the cash from that pledge mm -hmm. as what you raised that year? It's not the pledges, it's the cash you brought in. Mm -hmm. And then you know what cash to expect based on the pledge for future years, but you still need to get it. And that will in incentivize gift officers and fundraisers to stay close with your donors because you're counting their pledge payments in the current year. And as you can imagine, uh, fundraisers weren't too thrilled about that idea, but administration was. Well, yeah, because that has been an age old problem. I mean, we look at you know, uh, legacy gifts, and we look at generational wealth transference and how that looks and estate planning and all that. And it can really skew your sense of how well you're doing mm -hmm. versus the reality of what's actually coming through and going into the bank, right? Yeah. When, you get, money, plan, when you get when you get that bequest payment, mm -hmm. which bumped your year, well, don't yeah. budget next year based on this year. Right. <laughs> It's just not real. It's not repeatable. No. It's not recurring. Right, right. And, you know, I think, and we don't have much time left, but I think um, that was illustrated a lot with with COVID and with some of the 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 funding and the, the grants that came out and, you know, just this, these big um, inputs of money to, you know, various sectors. And then it's like, wow, okay, that's, that's not repeatable or it's not being, you know, uh, we're not navigating forward on that. It's over. And now there are a lot of organizations that are really behind the gun because they ramped up with the, this funding and hadn't really planned forward. Remember for the ice bucket challenge? That yes. Huge, that huge spike. I, I did a blog post on this. The next year, it went back to baseline. Yeah, it was and tragic. And it never really increased. No, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I could talk to you all day. Uh, Larry G. Raff, really interesting conversation. Um, I can't. Can't wait to take a test drive on your product. And, and we, like I said, we'll do that offline because I'm Definitely. fascinated by this. And I have been, and I continue to be in those, those meetings um, as a community leader, not a professional fundraiser. Um, and it's, it's tough and it's fraught with a lot of anxiety. I personally love it. I really like it, yeah. but you know, I'm, I get to do the fun part as I, as I see it um, and make that ask. Um, and I have never really had um, this background of information to help arm me um, like I think you're providing our sector. And so really interesting. Check out donorabacus.com. Two and you weeks. Can you can use it for free for two weeks. Okay. Well, okay. That's, e that's even better. Um, yeah. And, and you'll learn more about what they do and how they came up with this. And uh, Larry travels around and speaks. I know you were just, like you said, in New York yesterday, uh, speaking to a group of professional fundraisers. Um, so yeah, this is something really to take a look at for your organization. Another thing that we wanna make sure that you take a look at, and those are our presenting sponsors. We have amazing support from folks like Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leaders, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so we can have these really interesting conversations like we've had with Larry today. Okay, Larry, I think that there's a lot more, I would say a lot less stress going towards next asks for so many people that have been able to meet you today on the nonprofit show and learn about 
not only your product, but your mentality. I, I really enjoyed learning from you. It's It's been great. I really appreciate your time today. Well, thank you, Julie. For, thank you very it, much. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, um, each episode, we end with this message. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Thanks so much, Larry. Have a great day.